Hey everyone, Anarch here, and this is another episode of a new series I'm doing called Anarch Responds. Uh, today I'm going to be responding to comments under the video that I did uh, pretty far back at this point, which is The State is Counter-Revolutionary Part 2, which is a coverage of the early revolutionary period of the USSR. Before I get started on that, however, I'd like to point out to everybody watching this video that I just released the third in uh, the video series, A Modern Anarchism, which is this very uh, expansive uh, series of video essays that I'm doing, which cover the, the broad concepts of anarchist political theory um, in depth. So those, each of those video essays is like two hours long. And this last one is like two and a half hours long. So I just want to emphasize that I spend an enormous amount of time on these. Specifically, this last one I spent 10 months creating. So if you're watching this, please go over there and watch part three. And if you haven't seen the previous two parts, go watch parts one and part two. That'll probably be on the end card for this video. But with that in mind... Uh, let's kind of get started on the video. So I am just going to uh, go through and respond to some select comments. And uh, unlike the Anarch Abridged video, I'm just going to uh, let this video run as long as it goes. So this first one here is by, uh, what is that, Levy Chan. And it says, amazing analysis. Now shorten it to a five minute summary of why the USSR isn't leftist. Every leftist would need to watch that vid. It sounds like an impossible challenge, but hard and necessary things are worth doing. Also, I don't know how, how to into editing. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I love Lefty Tube, but it has an overemphasis on drawing out every point. I like long videos, but a TLDR companion needs to be made for our lazier cohorts. Um, I think I, I agree with this point in a general sense. However, I just want to emphasize that specifically this channel, if you're looking for, you know, very short uh, videos, this is probably not the channel you would want to go to. I think that I spend not a whole lot of time on introductions, except for perhaps what I've been doing with Anarch Abridged. And uh, what I really want to focus on in uh, on this channel is actually really dense theory. So the state is counter-revolutionary is purposely kind of long-winded. I'm spending a lot of time really uh, fleshing out all of the concepts, right? Not only is it a four-part series, but all of the parts of the series are themselves kind of long videos. Uh, I think that's something that's a really notable feature of the of this channel, Anarch, is that I am spending a lot of time deep diving into all of the concepts at hand. So it's not to say that I'm opposed to doing what you've said here. Uh, I've thought about doing a sort of video series that I don't know, I would call like Anarch Lectures or something where I just create like a short, you know, lecture that summarizes a previous video I've created. But uh, that would possibly be in the future if I can get more patrons and spend more of my time on this channel, then I think I could justify doing videos like that. Um, as you can see here, now that I'm starting to get more patrons on my Patreon, Patreon, which is patreon.com slash anarch. Um, notice that I'm starting to do videos that have a little higher production quality, even when they aren't the big video essays. And that's because I actually have time to work on these videos and edit them now because I can spend more time on the channel. I can justify doing that. So um, it's not to say I'm opposed to doing this, but not necessarily the focus of this channel. So here we have one by a user who we saw on part one here. I noticed this user went through and made extensive comments on every single part of this video. Uh, I think I even have more of their comments in, that I've, I've chosen here to respond to. Uh, so they point out, actually, Marx and Lenin both wanted to replace the army with workers' militia. 
So they didn't want a monopoly of violence. It was just a necessity during the Russian Civil War, and Lenin always planned to replace the standing army with a workers' militia after the Civil War. This just never happened because of the de degeneration of the worker state. See my answer to mutual aid works below. I didn't end up finding that. And Stalin preventing it. Uh, just responding, first of all, to the beginning of this. I think that that might be true of Marx, but I really dislike this tendency of authoritarian leftists to mention Marx and Lenin in the same breath, as if Marx and Lenin wanted the same things or proposed the same things. I don't think that's really true at all. Uh, Marx really wanted something very different from Lenin. Uh, what Lenin talked about in State and Revolution is probably the closest that Lenin ever got to agreeing with Marx, but there were still significant divergences. You know, uh, Lenin even essentially lays out that he just wants state capitalism in State and Revolution, whereas Marx was pretty well opposed to state capitalism later in his life, especially after the Paris Commune. Um, so this idea that Lenin wanted to like replace the armor army with a workers militia just kind of seems like this pie in the sky fantasizing. There's really nothing to indicate that that's the case. Every single time that Lenin had any power to make a decision, he made a decision to neuter the power of the workers and to instead empower the central state apparatus. And the excuses that are always used here about the civil war, um, really always fall short to me because once the civil war was over, and it really, you know, once the Civil War was not even over, but was already kind of dying down, we saw no real change towards worker control when that took place. Uh, there is no reason really to believe that that is what they wanted to do, nor that that's what Lenin wanted to do. Lenin in practice was a centralizer, and every single action that he carried out was an action that took power away from the workers and put power in the hands of state bureaucrats. So I just see no reason to believe that what Lenin wrote in state, uh, the State and Revolution actually mirrors what Lenin wanted. I think it's much, much more um, realistic to think that what Lenin was doing was speaking to a broadly libertarian socialist movement in Russia at the time that was trying to create a sort of libertarian socialism. And in order for Lenin and the Bolsheviks to appeal to that mass movement, uh, he had to, uh, you know, write a book that pretended that that is what he wanted as well. So no, I don't, I don't buy that at all. And uh, once again, there's this repetition of degenerated worker state, which is definitely always the dead giveaway of a Trotskyist. Um, I don't believe there's such a thing. Uh, I think that there just is no such thing as a worker state. So continuing on here. Also, the state was always intended by Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Trotsky. Yeah, see, like... Mentioning those four people in the same breath is absurd. They're all very different. All of them hold different uh, beliefs about different things. Uh, and so I just find it absurd to, to always, that people always try to pretend these people had such similar views on things. Um, to be elected from the Soviets below, i.e. bottom up. I think that's probably true of Marx and to a limited degree for Engels, but I, I see no reason to, to think that that is true of, of uh, either Lenin or Trotsky. Uh, both of them had power and had the ability to make decisions and with the power they were given, chose to take power away from the Soviets. Uh, this failed after the Civil War because of the consequences of years of civil war. Um, you know, this is just circular reasoning, you know, like there's just this assumption that, oh, because there was a civil war, there's just no going back after that. No going back. You know, you can't, it, it's like, these were ideal conditions for the creation of libertarian socialism. You know, like this, I, they're always appealing to the fact there was a civil war. There's going to be a civil war in pretty much every circumstance where revolution were to be carried out like this. So the fact that there was a civil war, you know, in Russia well, it doesn't matter. It, it, this is your test bed right here. And the test bed shows that if you give the state power during the Civil War, they will never give it back. So there's really no reason for us to buy this premise. Um, in, in fact, 
they had the power and they just didn't use it for that purpose. This failed, uh, yeah, because of the concept, which would have been over without 21 foreign armies of intervention. The backwardness of Russia and the isolation of the revolution, the backwardness of Russia. I always noticed that authoritarian leftists love to talk about how backwards Russia was, about how undeveloped it was, how stupid the peasantry were, and how untrained the, the, the workers were. Um, this is really not what the actual history bears out. What bears out is that they had a very radical peasantry, perhaps one of the most radical peasantries in the entire region at that time. Uh, Marx even commented as much that the, the Russian peasantry had a particularly radical and revolutionary spirit and had already prefigured a great deal of communes. In fact, the commune system was basically a default functioning for the majority of the Russian peasantry. And the urban proletariat was was to be honest, highly advanced and wanted a libertarian socialism. They were um, maybe not very technologically developed, but they were very ideologically um, uh, uh, fertile for this revolutionary activity. So I just really uh, find this very insulting to the workers of Russia. And I think it's just the parroting of a, an old... Uh, of old rhetoric that the Bolsheviks, the excuses of the Bolsheviks as to why they betrayed the revolution. Um, you need centralized planning if you want to run an advanced economy without a free market. Uh, I think that that requires proving there are, in fact, decentralized models which do the job as well. Uh, you know, one example just off the top of my head, but there are many, is Paracon, uh, participatory economics. That's one example of a decentralized planned economy. And in fact, decentralized planned economies were pretty much always the plan for the movement before the authoritarian leftists, which is to say all of the people who came after Lenin, basically, uh, distorted our understanding of what socialism and communism were. And before that, pretty much everybody recognized that the planning that was going to take place, even when they used this language of centrally planned, they were talking about councils of the people administering the society as it stood. They weren't talking about some small vanguard that was just domineering the revolution and making all the decisions for everyone. Uh, so this is a historic and it's a lie that is told by authoritarian leftists. So we, in fact, do have models. And in fact, we have more examples. Uh, we can see with the CNTFAI in Spain that they, in fact, were able to successfully run a decentrally planned economy with also some elements of, uh, you know, layered uh, planning of various types. Uh, they had some times where planning was done by particular like economic bureaus, you might say. And a lot of it was planned directly through the actual workers that rested within given areas. Uh, people that had seized the means of production, both in the cities and in the country. And in fact, they instituted nearly full communism in the countryside. You can go read about that if you just read about the, the Spanish Civil War. So this assumption that you have to do centralized planning in order to develop is just false. It's a, it's a, it's an article of faith for authoritarian leftists that is not borne out by reality. Um, today, there are long supply chains, and of course, the production must also meet the demand. I've never seen any possible way to make this both work without re free market or centralized planning. So we just responded to that. This person says, I am an anarcho-communist. I recognize the existence of the state is not ideal, but realistically, in order to implement the vast changes needed for working class prosperity and ecological sustainability worldwide does require national coalitions of some kind. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I just don't think those national coalitions have to be state entities. Um, I think that should be composed of localized democratic bodies, okay? The shared goals of communists and anarchists must be achieved through both mutual aid and a strong democratic union. We have to hold each other accountable and find a synthesis of praxis, in my opinion, to reach the material conditions that allow for revolutionary change. It's really important to understand that the material conditions for the people of the USSR are very different than modern America. We have to adapt these principles to the specific environments in which they are implemented. We can be critical of one another as leftists while still being supportive. International solidarity can only be maintained this way. So 
I'm definitely getting these sort of like left unity vibes out of this. And if any of you know, I am not pro left unity. I am pro libertarian socialist unity. I think all sorts of libertarian socialists should band together and cooperate, but that libertarian socialists and authoritarian leftists should not cooperate. And that in fact, it's impossible for them to cooperate because they have uh, opposing methods for getting things done. And that if one of them succeeds at their method, they, they fundamentally undermine the other one's method. And so uh, I don't take this idea that we have to like, you know, come to some sort of synthesis between our positions. There is no such thing as a synthesis between these positions. They are diametrically opposed in a principal sense. So that's not really possible. Uh, I, I, you know, obviously it's true that uh, it's important to understand the material conditions for the people of the USSR are very different than modern America. But as I've already said, I really don't think the excuses about the material conditions of the USSR justify what was done there. I actually think it was the wrong decision, and it's the reason why that Russia is currently just out-and-out out capitalist. Uh, it's because there, that method was a failed method that really just carried out bourgeois productive development. That is to say, it really developed the, the capitalist supply chains, capitalist infrastructure that was necessary to just create a capitalist society, because it was developed in the same way that capitalists develop their society. So it's very important, I would say, it's not like I'm disagreeing with the bulk of this. I think the majority of what's being said here is true. But I think the vibe I'm getting that we're supposed to be like supportive of the USSR, uh, I completely disagree with that. I do not think we should be supportive of the USSR. That's not to say, of course, that we can't recognize where it did things right. Uh, I think that it was good that the USSR would, you know, overthrew monarchy. <laughs> that was a good thing. And uh, it was good as well that, the, you know, I, was, I guess I would say I support both the February and the October Revolution. Uh, I just think that the decisions that were made to undermine the Soviets, the to undermine the bottom up control cannot be defended and must be staunchly criticized and that there is no synthesis between the horizontal method and this method. That method must be wholesale rejected. Okay, so if you'll recall last time, this person, this person is the one that I kind of laughed at their comment. And, uh, you know, they didn't put any time markers on this. I, you know, I, I really tried to consider whether I should even include it because there's like, we don't even know when this was, you know, what, what are they responding to with half of these? <laughs> um, number one, have we really devolved into linguistics now? I saw how linguistics helped the freedom established in Catalonia don't even know what that means, to be honest. Uh, I think they're talking about how worker control, I talk about in the video how worker control essentially got distorted by the Bolsheviks uh, to go from meaning actual direct control over the means of production and decisions about how things were done to basically just that they got to, uh, you know, see the decisions of the Bolsheviks before they were made. Um, and that they got to elect representatives that made decisions for them. And that that just that's how worker control got redefined. Um, so, yeah, like there was what, you know, a linguistic shift uh, in the meaning of this word worker control, which everybody kind of recognized meant one thing when the revolution began, which is to say they had a recognition of what socialism actually was, worker control of the means of production. And then over time, it drifted into meaning state control of the means of production, because that's what the Bolsheviks wanted it to mean. Um, and then, you know, some of these like, who even knows they're referring to interesting points. Very interesting. The whole committees versus unions affair. I mean, they're talking about how I think they're probably talking about the difference between the factory committees and the trade unions and how the trade unions sold out faster than the factory committees uh, deal with the devil. Oh, for Christ's sake, I will take it as a joke for dramatic effect. I mean, I wouldn't call it a joke necessarily, you know, uh, a deal with the devil insofar as that it was a deal with capitalism. So obviously I'm not talking about the devil. I mean, you know, it's a little tongue in cheek, but no, it was a, it was a major mistake as I laid out in this uh, previous, you know, in kind of my response to the previous comment, it was a huge mistake. Uh, it led to the establishment of capitalism in Russia instead of socialism, even when they had so much promise, so much promise to have actually created socialism there. 
uh, wait, you were criticizing these decisions being made at the time of the Civil War? Yeah, I know not dying to fascists is a difficult concept for the anarchists. This is just so smarmy. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't know that what they did is actually the reason why that they were able to hold off the fascists. In fact, it should be said uh, that to the South, you had... Um, uh, the free territories of Ukraine that were led by by uh, Nestor Makhno and a variety of other anarchists. And these this was an anarchist region with highly dis- decentral military power. And it was very, very successful in defeating the white army in all fronts that it was fighting. In fact, um, historians who have analyzed the actions of the, the black army to the south have concluded that Russia probably would have lost that civil war to the white army if it were not for the actions of the free territories of Ukraine. So uh, it does not stand to reason that what Russia did was absolutely necessary to win the civil war. I see it more as kind of a knee jerk fear response by the Bolsheviks. Um, And there's probably also some cynical, uh, um, you know, desire to accumulate power. Um, was this public unrest the majority's will? Do people want the abolition of the state? Does democracy even matter? See, this is very unusual. I think they're responding to the fact that there was like vast political unrest after the Civil War was basically over. And uh, this is during the time that the Kronstadt Rebellion took place. Yeah, you can see right after Kronstadt, really? Like, I think this person's just fully brainwashed by what they've been told by authoritarian leftists. Um, the thing for me is that the, the basis of our, of our leftist beliefs is supposed to be that we're creating a society of mass emancipation or mass empowerment, where the people get to make the decisions for themselves about what they do and do not want. So when there is a mass revolt, this is in itself a referendum against the system. It is a statement the system is doing something wrong, and they are right in in desiring uh, more control over their society, more libertarian socialism. That is an inherently good thing for them to want, number one. But number two, it is it is um, a, a description of how the current structure is falling short. So um, if they're coming forth and they're saying that what they want is economic democracy, a.k.a socialism, then yes, that absolutely does matter. And it's not clear whether they necessarily wanted the abolition of the state. Um, I wouldn't go that far. But they did, in fact, want economic democracy. They were desiring a return to the conditions at the very beginning um, in 1917, before Lenin's draft um, draft decrees. So yes, in fact, it does matter. And the fact that they're rebelling is meaningful. And it's so bizarre to me that people can side against the Kronstadt Rebellion. It only shows to me that they didn't do any research. The Kronstadt Rebellion, if you just look at its list of demands, these are all explicitly leftist demands. These are explicitly socialist and even communist demands. It is a desire for return to economic um, democracy, a a return to worker control over the means of production, a.k.a. socialism. Okay, so the idea that if any authoritarian leftist is ever like anti Kronstadt to you, this either means A, they haven't done their research, or B, if they have done their research and they've seen the demands of the Kronstadt rebellion and they side against them, they've just straight up told you that they would suppress any attempts to create socialism if they ever had power in a country. And that person's kind of just admitting to you that they are a reactionary, that they would suppress any sort of desire to attain freedom and emancipation uh, within the, the the state that they had controlled. They're telling you they would suppress you if you tried to create socialism. So this person has clearly bought the propaganda. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, once again, no timestamps. Who knows? Uh, mustache man, bad. I mean, I don't know. I don't really talk about Stalin very much in this in this uh, this video actual worker control established. Yeah, once again, no timestamp, who knows. And then I find it so funny. These they, this is just like the last one where they're like saying all these kind of smarmy little underhanded things and it ends with this with this message. Great video. <laughs> Puts one in need of further research, aka research, you know, buying into your narratives, I'm sure. The general lack of 
of anything actually scientific, aka things that that you know conform to their biases, in approach and in general, a lack of investigation. Yeah, no, I know. I only read like twelve books for this. No, no, I know. I just did not do enough investigation. I didn't read enough Stalin. I should have read more Stalin. Right? Really disturbs what this video could have been. However, I expected much worse in this video with the usual anarchist standards on takes, a solid 7.5 out of 10. Well, I'm so grateful. Uh, forces one into further research, and this is the most you can actually ask from a video of this quality that doesn't claim to be an actual serious, serious scientific work or research. No, no, I, I want to be clear. I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's intended to be a serious, sci uh, not maybe a scientific work, but a, a, a work of, of research, certainly. Um, I think that people can probably derive a lot about what happened in the Russian Revolution from this video, and uh, likewise the Chinese Revolution from part three. Uh, I think that really they just don't like the, the um, positions that I've taken here. So that's really what it boils down to. Uh, uh, Blue Smoke says, any resources like this but for Cuba? Um, certainly not on my channel. I haven't done one for Cuba. Uh, I've had lots of people request as much. Um, I don't actually know of a resource that is like the state is counter-revolutionary, but for Cuba. Uh, uh, so the answer to that is just no. I included this just because I've actually had quite a few people ask if the, this pretty much this exact question. Uh, and what I've often said is that I would be willing to do, you know, the state is counter revolutionary, uh, uh, more installations of that, that cover, for example, uh, Cuba or Yugoslavia, because I think these are both very interesting case studies, but, uh, yeah, so the answer is no, not to my knowledge, at least. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, at 4425, which is basically the end of the video, you can hear Anarch's cat meow. Yes, that is true. Yes, you can hear a cat meow at the very end of that video. <laughs> I was recording voiceover and the, right as I finished the voiceover, the cat meowed. So uh, yeah, there's a little Easter egg for you. Oh, gosh. Okay, this one's this one's long. Um, all right. Yeah, I remember this. At the end of the video, you make a lot of somewhat vague implications and claims against the post-Lenin, i.e. Stalin period. I don't understand why didn't you dwell more into this when this period is when the USSR actually claimed that it achieved socialism. Um, I mean, to answer the first d d question, it's because that's just absolutely false. Um, the There was only movement into more state capitalism as you proceed further into the history of the USSR. There were token attempts to move to decentralization, um, token attempts to put power back into the hands of the workers, but they were mostly symbolic. They uh, didn't usually represent anything of any consequence. And by comparison to uh, the power that the workers had, the direct worker control that the workers had at the beginning of, uh, not the beginning of 1917, but uh, uh, the end of 1917, right before Lenin's draft decrees, it is absolutely pales in comparison. It is, it is not even 10% of the worker control over the means of production that, that had taken place at that point. So all of these represent at most mild social democratic reforms that pretended to have something to do with socialism. So that's the reason I don't really talk about it. It's just kind of a waste of time to talk about state capitalism dallying with social democracy, you know, like it, it, it didn't make any movement towards worker control of the means of production, at least no meaningful movement. So there was no reason for me to dwell on that. Just like in part three, I don't dwell on Deng, Xiaoping, and and modern China. I mean, there was just nothing left of anything about socialism by the time that Deng Xiaoping was was um, in power. So, yeah, uh, that's the the simple answer to the, the first part of this question. In fact, the 1918 Constitution never claimed that the country was socialist, while the 1936 Constitution explicitly said so. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's false. Um, would it not then make more sense to analyze this period and try to prove that the Soviets didn't achieve, achieve socialism by that time? Uh, you know, I guess you could see it that way. But once again, the analysis that was already in existence in the part that I did pretty well bears out that the same critiques could be applied. Like, once again, it was just them dallying with social democracy. 
Um, I also find it interesting and somewhat funny that you describe Yugoslav market socialism as genuine socialism and that the USSR only tried to undermine Yugoslavia because of that. Um, all I remember is kind of a, a mild reference to Yugoslavia in this video. I don't think I really went into explicit detail. Uh, I think that what Yugoslavia did is closer to actual socialism. I think it had much more economic democracy. The workers had much more control over the means of production. Uh, but I'm not exactly like pointing to Yugoslavia as an ideal example of socialism that I'm trying to emulate. Uh, it just is a better example of socialism than the USSR. Uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's continued existence of a market is obviously problematic to some degree, but, uh, workers actually had more control over the means of production in Tito's U Yugoslavia than they did in the USSR. Uh, I also don't understand why do anarchists fetishize market socialism in general? This is such a weird claim. Uh, anarchists don't quote unquote fetishize market socialism. Uh, they just recognize that, you know, or, or I should say there are anarchists who are market socialists and we call them market anarchists. And I would say they're uh, a minority of the movement. It's instead that anarchists recognize that creating economic bodies that are controlled by the workers, even if they exist within the market, that's closer to socialism than a central state apparatus uh, accumulating profits off of the back of the laborers and then redistributing them as, as they please. That is much closer to capitalism. The state acting as the monopoly capitalist is much closer to just straight out capitalism than a market orientation where you have basically a proliferation of cooperatives. So that's what's going on. The, the anarchists in general are not really supporting market socialism. They're just recognizing it's closer to the goal than state capitalism is. Although I don't agree with virtually anything this video presents, wow, that's a very sweeping statement, that does not mean that I think this is a bad video. In fact, this is probably the best video on the state by an anarchist that I've watched. And it definitely gave me insight by what do anarchists actually mean by a state and whatnot. Also, just the quality of editing and sound is great. I'm looking forward to seeing what you have to say about Mao. Cheers. So I'm just going to assume, you know, they go on to probably watch part three. And uh, maybe uh, by the time I get around to discussing part three, we'll see if this person commented again. Uh, okay, so I chose this one because actually a lot of people have mentioned, you know, could I ask about the music played throughout the video? As I've said, the music in my videos is a big topic of conversation in the comments. Uh, if it's too loud or it's too soft or if I put too much music in or I shouldn't, shouldn't have any music whatsoever. And um, some people like this person are actually just interested in what pieces that I chose for the video. So I just wanted to uh, bring this one up because... I do think it's a worthy project for me to go and list what all of the songs are in the videos. And it's not to say I won't do that at a later date, but it is kind of a lot of effort. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to go look through the files and then make a big list. And then I'd have to timestamp all of them probably. And um, it's, it's not to say it's something I won't do, but it's not something I would expect in the near future. I have, I have uh, more, you know, bigger projects to focus on. But once again, these are the sorts of tasks you could, you could expect me to do more often as my Patreon grows. So if you want to go become a Patreon at patreon.com slash anarch, these are the sorts of tasks that are, that it's more likely I will, I will do. Uh, because I would have, I have more free time to devote to the channel and I have to worry less about making ends meet. Um, oh yeah. So this one, this one I chose just because I think it, you know, it, it made me feel good. Okay. It says genuine, uh, they said it's pa body. A genuine, sincere thank you for the series. As a citizen of Russia, it actually helps contextualize not only our so flawed history, but also the strange fetishization, fetishization of the USSR by our current dictatorship and the reciprocation of its militaristic extremes, which I never truly understood until now. And oh God, this is all so desperately tragic. I can't believe how fucking sad this is. Thank you. Yeah, the reason I chose this one, and you know, I, I haven't chosen a lot of these sort of praising uh, comments, and you know, there's a lot of praising comments in, in these videos. The state is kind of revolutionary, uh, it got very good reception, very little criticism. Um, 
is because I'm actually really pleased that this could help somebody who actually lives in Russia understand their circumstances a little better. So this one's always kind of stood out to me. I think this one has like some of the highest com uh, likes of, of any comment on this video. So. Um, okay, that is way too long of a name. Not going to read it. There's no better way to spend a Sunday afternoon in quarantine, quarantine than a new Anarch video. I can't even imagine how much effort was put into this analysis. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. The state is counter-revolutionary, uh, pretty much all of it. I think parts one through four were, were like created in quarantine, I think. Uh, I have a terrible memory for those kinds of things. But but I was doing a, a lot of the research for these while, while we were in quarantine. I know at least parts two and three were done while we were in quarantine. So, uh, so yeah, just an interesting factoid here. And, uh, yeah, an enormous amount of effort was put into the state as counter-revolutionary parts one, two, three, and four. I, I did a huge amount of research for every one of these video essays. I read like at, usually like at least 10 books. Um, I am constantly citing works that I have read previously. I am constantly trying to integrate analysis that I have um, uh, developed over the course of all of the books that I've read. So just to understand these take a, a huge amount of effort. And specifically, The State is Counter-Revolutionary. That series was a real emotional toll, okay? Okay. Um, researching these examples where there really was this sort of hopeful possibility that something beautiful could have happened and the workers could have had control over their lives. It really is very, very tragic and emotionally draining. Uh, researching for parts two and three especially was very emotionally draining. Uh, it was not enjoyable to research and uh, uh, to a large degree, it was not super enjoyable to write. It was really only enjoyable to release these, uh, which, you know, that might not sound very pleasing as a viewer, but, you know, these were these were very difficult to produce um, for that reason. Not just difficult in the amount of effort they, they required, but uh, emotionally they were difficult. Um, uh, this is Sylvia. Uh, I always thought Marxism-Leninism was incorrect for its assertion that the state would disappear on its own. And I've always been uncomfortable with the state socialists' love and respect for <laughs> batshit insane dictatorships. Uh, you've more or less articulated my thinking on the subject quite well. Yeah, no, I mean, that's the fundamental delusion at the center of the authoritarian leftist mentality is that somehow if you make the state really, really powerful and you allow it to just take away all of the rights of the workers and the workers become disempowered and they have no way to really defend themselves, that somehow that, that will lead to the state becoming less powerful. I think that that is just... Um, a fundamental demonstration they don't have a coherent power analysis. Um, they are sort of stuck in a rigid orthodoxy, and they don't really think through the problems from the basis of how power functions. Uh, I think that's the fundamental flaw of the authoritarian leftists. They don't understand how power functions. And then here's Lucky Black Cat, which I've included this partially just because shout out to Lucky Black Cat. Uh, but Lucky Black Cat says, finally watched it. Another great video. You present the information really well. And I think if I didn't already agree with you, I'd think you make a convincing case. I've had a lot of people tell me that the state is counter-revolutionary is what turned them into an anarchist and made them stop questioning if they could be a Marxist-Leninist or whatever. So that is, seems to be true. Lots of people have told me that it was a turning point in their ideological journey. And I'm very pleased to know that. Um, I had no idea there was a wave of suicides after the Civil War ended, but the repression of the working class was not eased. So sad, but not at all surprising. I can't imagine the heartbreak and anguish of living through a revolution and then seeing it crushed. Devastating. Really looking forward to part three. So, yeah, that was... That was 
but again, you know, this was one of the reasons it was so emotionally draining. It was also, you know, reading these accounts of how people were so deeply devastated by the fact that after the Civil War was over, they weren't given any power back. You know, these people that were diehards who, you know, were such committed revolutionaries. Um, and that includes, for example, the Kronstadt sailors that the person earlier was smearing. Very committed revolutionary soldiers who, after the war was over, were um, uh, believing that power would be given back to them. Uh, but as we've said, that's not how power works. Um, centralization of power is... Uh, uh, counter to the development of bottom-up power. It, it, it's a force of sabotage for that to take place. So yeah, reading about the wave of suicides was also very distressing. Uh, Siler Beige says, these videos would be awesome to have as an essay or a pamphlet. So I just want to emphasize lots of people in the comments said that. These have now been published on the Anarchist Library. So the entire compilation, parts one through four, have all been smashed together in one big essay. Uh, and that's on the Anarchist Library. You can find that in the comments to that video. Or you can find that in the description to that video. You could also just go Google um, Anarchist Library, The State is Counter-Revolutionary, and it'll bring up the text version. And you could print that if you like. They actually, um, one of the cool things about Anarchist Library, if, if you didn't know this already, is that they can, uh, they have a way where you can go click up at the top where the little icons are, and it'll say like A4 imposed, and it will essentially just create uh, uh, a version of that text on Anarchist Library that is ready to be printed as a zine. And all you got to do is print that out and just staple it. So like if you wanted to create, if you wanted to create zines of this, you could. Anarchist Library already has that ready to go. So this person's sock says, as much harm as he did, I've always pitied Lenin. He seems to have actually believed he was doing what needed to be done to bring about socialism and a more just world. But his ideology seems to have blinded him to what he was truly doing until less than a year before his death. I can't even imagine what was going through his mind as he laid on his deathbed, barely able to write his last denouncements of the communists and himself. Yeah, I understand this perspective. Um... Perhaps maybe because I read so much about Lenin and his opinions leading up to the Revolutionary War, uh, hearing how he acted towards other people in revolutionary organizations, how treacherous and deceitful he was, um, how much of a power hoarder he was at almost every single turn, how many bad decisions he made in taking power away from the workers, um, how disdainful he was of direct worker control and uh, believing that the workers had to be domineered or commanded from above. I don't have a very charitable opinion of Lenin. I definitely don't look at him as a tragic figure. I look at him as kind of a villain. But I understand that even a lot of anarchists and libertarian socialists see it otherwise, kind of as you've said here. Um, that being said, it does seem like he kind of realized what he had done wrong at the very end of his life. And uh, uh, as I say in that video, he sort of admits that they basically were just a slightly modified version of the czarist bureaucracy. Um, Dr. Anarchy says, Marx agrees with you on this take. The quote on how the workers can't take the ready-made machinery of the state and make it not reactionary comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really the big key to understand is that if what you do is like, quote unquote, seize the state, but all you do is use all of its bureaus and apparatuses and uh, power structures as they are, and then you just rename them and put them under slightly different control, the, the structures themselves have been embedded into the world you know, they, the, the supply chains and the logistics and the infrastructure itself demands a certain way of interacting with all of those power structures. And if what happens is you just want to jump into the driver's seat, you want to kick everybody out who is there and then jump into the driver's seat, you're going to find that you need people to do most of the same tasks as before. 
you need people to do uh, administration. You need people to, do, to consult about how to run the businesses, how to manage logistics. And so what you're going to end up being forced to do is those who didn't act as reactionaries and, and you know, go off to the white army, as this is what we see in the USSR, um, essentially end up just tutoring you on how to run a capitalist economy again. And that's exactly what happened. They introduced, you know, um, capitalist labor control in the form of Taylorism, literally created by American capitalists. They instituted it directly and they got direct um, uh, uh, consultation from the previous capitalist class, from the previous administrators. And they used that consultation in order to create state capitalism. So, yeah, that's the reason it will always fail. There's no way to do it right. It was never a worker state. It's impossible to have a worker state. Jimbology says, until half an hour ago, I hated the USSR for what it was. Now I'm lamenting what it could have been. Yeah. Uh, I've talked to a lot of anarchists who apparently this piece was the first one to kind of inform them that there was a lot of hope. There was a lot of uh, potential, hope and potential for what the USSR could have been at the very, very beginning, right after the October Revolution, especially given the incredible bottom-up impulse that led them to this revolutionary project. It really could have been something so beautiful. So many things came together to make the Russian Revolution. And, and the mistakes that took place there really are so tragic. And I think it is a much better orientation to understand it that way, not to look at the USSR as just kind of this like, you know, atrocious dictatorship, which I suppose there were aspects of it, which absolutely were, but instead to understand it as sort of the, uh, uh, the grave marker on what was a socialist revolution. So... Okay, I included this one because they are absolutely right. Uh, and I want to be, I want to be clear. They say, uh, I went and looked at the textual version for some citations and I didn't see any for the chapter two conclusion section. I'm particularly interested in the third paragraph, which talks about the USSR sabotage of anarchistic movements in other countries. Um, where could I look to learn more about this? Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I think that, uh, I didn't, I didn't cite uh, what I meant by that, but just clarifying for anybody that's also curious about that, I've had a couple other people mention what I, they're like, what are you, what are you talking about here? I'm talking about Spanish Catalonia, uh, which is a CNTFAI during the Spanish Civil War that was d directly sabotaged by Stalin and then the USSR, uh, the Free Territories of Ukraine, which was directly sabotaged by Trotsky and the USSR. And uh, we have various other examples. Everywhere that the Soviet Union interacted, it acted to destroy whatever libertarian socialist impulse was, was there. Um, if there were anarchists, they were to be crushed or suppressed. Uh, this is pretty much just the universal uh, effect of the USSR. Every single time it ever intervened anywhere, it was a force that suppressed libertarian socialism. And that was because it was, once again, perpetuating this capitalist consultation that they had received from the previous bourgeois uh, class that had arisen in Tsarist Russia. And so they went and they took that, that tutoring from the capitalists and they taught it to the other quote unquote socialist nations. They basically taught them how to do state capitalism instead of socialism. And they also taught them how to crush whatever insurgent libertarian socialism was uh, taking place in their context. So, um, all right. Daily Bread Neighbor says, Marxist Leninists I encounter have argued that the USSR was state socialist and not state capitalist because of where profits go. <coughs> They'll argue that profits in capitalism go toward enriching the capitalists, the private owners of the means of production, who will use that wealth to influence the liberal democracy toward their class interests. In state socialism, by contrast, profits from state-owned enterprises are reinvested in the working class to improve their quality of life. Um... That even if party leaders dip their hands a little deep into the state profit cookie jar, none even approach the wealth in excess of Western capitalists, and the lion's share of profits were spent on the public. 
Is this a fair distinction, or are they just redefining socialism away from worker ownership of the means of production? Is state socialism even a thing? I mean, I will say that I think you kind of already <laughs> intuited what I was going to say here, and that is, yeah, they're just redefining uh, what the meaning of capitalism and socialism is. And might I add, if all that socialism is, is redistributing profits for the, in the interests of the masses, then you think social democracy is socialism. Like you're literally doing the meme. I'm not, not this person, I'm not targeting them, but I'm talking like in a general sense, you're literally doing the meme. Socialism is when the government does stuff. Communism is when it does more stuff, right? Or when it does all the stuff, like that's literally the meme. So anybody who tries to tell you that like, Oh, socialism is just when the government uh, appropriates the profits of enterprise and then, uh, you know, turns them to account of the workers. Okay, so uh, social democracy? Like, okay, so if we just have really good welfare programs or we have really good, you know, social safety nets, that's socialism? That's all you want? That's what you're fighting for? Your, your conception of socialism is just really good safety nets, but still you get exploited by capitalists? Capitalism is not defined as the capitalists benefit from profit accumulation. Capitalism is a system wherein uh, laborers are waged and do not own the means of production, that all they own is their labor and that they exchange the full value of their labor for a wage. That is the traditional understanding of capitalism. And there's all kinds of other things about it. Yes, it is a lot about profit accumulation. It is a system which is very much defined by its sort of obsession with profit accumulation. But it is not about that, you know, if the capitalists were just to all be like benevolent and were to just pay into like charities and stuff that all at once it wouldn't be capitalism anymore. You know, if everybody were just like Bill Gates and paid their money into charities, that's not capitalism because it's going to the account of the people. So it's like just uh, precisely as they say. It's just them redefining socialism away from worker ownership of the means of production, trying to turn it into something else so that they can claim victory when they've achieved no victory. <coughs> uh, this person, I think it says Midgert. As a statist social democrat, this was awesome stuff. Rarely do you find so pointed a critique of the USSR as this. The lack of control mechanisms in states are what lead to tyranny. It was no accident that Lenin went after the Soviets first and foremost. I especially like that you don't absolve Trotsky of his role in this. Lots of ML apologists will read some of his earlier, more libertarian work and use him as some sort of shining beacon of what could have been had it not been for Stalin. Yeah, no, I, having read all of the, you know, reading Trotsky, reading Stalin, reading Lenin and so on, and reading about the history of the things they've done, I, I, none of this absolved Trotsky of anything. Trotsky was a monster. I mean, he was on the scale of Stalin. He, you know, he was, he was uh, atrocious. He, he led to the, the death of the crime. Kronstadt rebellion. He led to the destruction of the free territories of Ukraine. He was um, one of the worst people involved in the USSR. Um, his early libertarian uh, uh, tendencies were utterly abandoned by him as soon as he had power. So yeah, no, Trotsky doesn't deserve to be absolved. But the reason I included this one is just I wanted to note in, in you know, this is another one of those where I'm not trying to go in on this person, but I just kind of disagree with them a little bit. And that is that the lack of control mechanisms in state are what lead to tyranny. Um, basically, they're they're repeating the idea that that states are fine so long as they have like accountability and that there is such a thing as accountability for states. Um, I think this is a fundamental uh, this is fundamentally false. I don't think that you can hold states accountable. I think that that is at most a limited affair and that states are going to function as per their internal uh, power relations. The power relations which inherently drive them, those are going to animate their function, not whether we can quote unquote hold them accountable because we can't. They hold the power in they ha their hands. They have control of the military. They have control of the regulations of, of industry. They have control over 
all of those things of spy networks and diplomacy and all of that. So I don't really believe in this conception of quote unquote, holding the state accountable. So when I look at the USSR and what happened there, I don't see it as, oh, it was a failure, you know, a structural failure to hold the state accountable. I just see this as yet another example of why the state is, is counter-revolutionary, precisely as the video says. It's a fundamentally counter-revolutionary entity. It is against state or it is against socialist revolution. It, it is, is anti-proletarian revolution. Okay, so this one. Uh, there are certainly problems with the USSR and other socialist countries in particular, and I think it's supposed to say in particular, but we shouldn't abandon using studies on its successes, such as quality of life and its insane growth as tools promoting socialism and economic planning. Um, I think probably y'all have already seen me respond enough that I'm that you can see why I disagree with this. I just don't even think they are examples of socialism. Uh, but we also need to heavily separate ourselves from the idea that a criticism of the USSR and any socialist country is a criticism of socialism itself. It can be, but it depends. Uh, no, no, I, I don't think that any criticism of the USSR could be considered a criticism of socialism because there was nothing socialist about the USSR. So there's also no reason to defend it as an example of socialism. In fact, I would recommend nobody defend it as an example of socialism. In fact, if you ever hear a normal person bring up to you the USSR as an example of socialism, the first thing you should say is that it isn't socialism, that it didn't have worker ownership of the means of production, there was no worker control of the means of production, and therefore it just wasn't socialist. Um, almost every time a criticism come again, comes against any socialist country, it is automatically implied to be a criticism of socialism. To solve this, simply point out the outside trying to destroy them. Yeah, no, I, I disagree. Um, it's not to say, of course, that there, what, there is not extensive intervention to destroy these countries. There absolutely are. And it's not to say that, you know, a lot of their responses may have may, may not have been conditioned by their, the, you know, this intervention. I think that's also a fair observation, but there's no reason to defend them as examples of socialism uh, as per that fact, uh, that, that they're just not examples of socialism. They're examples of state capitalism and the, the you know, siege responses that they 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 um, underwent can be understood as attempts for state capitalism to continue sustaining itself, not f they not for socialism to continue sustaining itself. Um, also, it's pretty easy to spin back around. For example, in North Korea, there's a food shortage problem, but you can spin it around on them by pointing out the U.S. is actively causing it by stopping shipping. Yeah, I'm once again, I don't want to go in on this person. I'm not trying to be mean to them or anything, but this is an exact example of what we call whataboutism. Right. So North Korea is bad. And you go, yeah, well, what about what about the United States? What about, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, no, you don't need to do any of that. In fact, I would recommend against doing any of that. If you can't defend the project on its own merits, then don't defend it. Like you don't need to point out that there are other bad guys on Earth. You know, if I if I tell you, you know, Man, it's screwed up that they're that they've uh, you know they kill gay people in Uganda. Uh, you don't need to tell me. Oh yeah, we'll look at the fascists killing gay people in the United States. It's like you don't need to <laughs> you don't need to run interference. Like it's just not necessary, and it's also irrelevant to the fact that gay people are being killed in Uganda. That there are also gay people being killed in the United States. It's just an irrelevant point. It's a it's a redirect that has nothing to do with the point at hand. And I just want to say, insofar as that you're taking this tack, um, uh, either this person or anybody listening, people see this as deceptive because it is this this approach to argumentation is a deceptive practice. That's why it's been given the name "What Aboutism." Yeah, this person points out something that I've I've often found just kind of the uh, ironic. Yeah, uh, Void Sworn says strikes and demonstrations are harmful in quotes because it's from the video. They are supposed to hurt. <laughs> Otherwise, why do them? Sounds like the Cappies whining. Exactly, it's the exact same complaints. Precisely the same complaints because 
the Bolsheviks took on the class characteristics of the capitalists. And so they defended capitalism and the capitalistic system and its functioning with the same zeal that the, the, the traditional capitalists defend capitalism. And so just like a capitalist is upset when the workers go on strike, so were the Bolsheviks, so were the functionaries of the state, because they have the same interests, essentially, as the capitalists did, which is to continue the functioning of the machine, to continue profit accumulation, to continue having their hands on the wheel. And so that's why you see them basically making the argument of capitalists, which is so bizarre. Um, and then this one I put in here because... Honestly, you just get asked it all the time. And uh, I, I identify this as being one of the most common thing for like um, authoritarian leftists to ask. And I think sometimes it's in bad faith, but sometimes it's actually in good faith too. Um, I think they're just like genuinely curious. And that is, how would an anarchist society defend itself against neighboring states wanting to expand their territory? And it says its territory, but I think their territory. Or, you know, trying to invade its territory is probably kind of what they mean. Um, the presumption here is that they can't, the presumption is that they're bad at doing that. And I think that's at the root of why a lot of authoritarian leftists tend towards statism is because in their minds, they see the state as an absolutely necessary component to defend against outside forces trying to sabotage them. And they historically, I think, came to this conclusion, and, and of course, you know, there's some malice and bad faith involved, but I'm just kind of trying to address the real uh, uh, perceptions of the argument that, you know, they look at Spanish Catalonia and they look at the free territories and they say they both failed to defend themselves. Both of those were betrayed. <laughs> you know, those are now we have more modern examples where we see that there are horizontal societies, you know, for example, Rojava, which, you know, it's not fully horizontal, but it, it's got a lot of horizontal components to it. And the Zapatistas who have existed for decades, you know, Rojava over a decade and the Zapatistas over two decades. I, I do really think that a lot of what was taking place in in both of those occasions that are used as examples of anarchists not being able to defend themselves, of horizontal power structures not being able to defend themselves, were because they shouldn't have trusted the USSR. Like, that's straight up. Straight up. They should not have trusted the USSR, and they should not have been making deals. For example, in the, Sp in the Spanish anarchists, they should not have made deals with the, with the Spanish Republic. That was a big mistake. Um, so... The answer, the simple answer is confederations of militias and the confederations of militias can delegate people as is needed. Um, like, you know, they essentially like uh, other other more authoritarian thinkers may just see this as like an army or whatever, but it ha it's distinctly different. It's not centralized and hierarchical. It is a bunch of militia structures all functioning, uh, w you know, coordinating with one another, but functioning in a very decentral fashion, uh, responding to particular information. And this is actually highly successful. Um, it's really weird how people act like you need 100% need a super centralized army to succeed when the armies that keep winning against centralized army and armies in a historic sense tend to be ones that use decentral guerrilla tactics. Um, in the modern era, decentral guerrilla tactics have a huge amount of success. So I could go real deep into this one, and I'm not going to go deep into it, but I'm just going to say this is a recurring question, and the simple answer is confederations of militias. Ah, yes. And I think we're coming around to the end. I think this is one of the last ones in the list. Uh, this one is actually kind of an interesting observation. I could see how they were confused. Uh, it's back to RFV again. You know, once again, they left a bunch of very detailed questions and comments and criticisms. Uh, what do you mean with, by autumn 1918, the National Soviet had no more meetings? They say there was no body called the National Soviet. The National Soviet body was called the All-Russian Congress of Soviets and continued to meet at least once a year until 1922. The Fifth Congress was in 1918, the Sixth was in, okay, and so on and so on. Um, here's the thing. I was not very specific about what I meant here, but there's a reason for that, and that is there were a variety of bodies that sort of represented a National Soviet body. And they were 
honestly, over the course of these years, kind of rapidly cycled through. So I've got some examples here. Um, this is what I'm referring to from the original text. Um, so it references the Vasenka here, and the Vasenka was a was one of these national Soviet bodies. A government decree fixes the composition of the Vasenka to 30 members nominated by the All-Russian Central Council of Trade Unions. Um, so it should be said that the there was a previous iteration which actually had more members. So this body, this big body that that um, you know managed the national affairs, it kept have it kept having narrower and narrower control. Um, and see here, uh, within a year of the capture of state power by the Bolsheviks, the relations of production. Shaken for a while, the height of the mass movement had reverted to the classical authoritarian pattern seen in all class societies. The workers as workers had been diverted of any meaningful uh, decisional authority in the matters that concerned them. Uh, and what it says here up in this previous paragraph, it was uh, essentially a... a it's supposed to implement the policies decided at the monthly meetings of the Vasenka's members, but it soon came to undertake more and more of the work. After the autumn of 1918, full meetings of the Vasenka were no, no longer held. It had become a department of the state. So they're right to say that there were meetings of this thing called the, you know, uh, what was it? All, na the, uh, uh, all Russian Congress of Soviets. But what I'm saying is the actual body of worker control was dissolved by autumn of that year. So that body did not even last to the end of 1918. That's the point that's being made here. Uh, the particular name is not really what I was concerned with, but perhaps if I were to ever publish this as a book or something, maybe I would try to be a little more specific so that confusion like this wouldn't arise. But there's also this uh, uh, description of this sort of rapid change that was taking place, you know, between 1917 and 1932. The Vasinka uh, was, you know, kind of being transformed into all kinds of various things. Um, you know, it was originally launched in December 5th in 1917. Um, and then it got transformed and was support subordinated to the Subnarkum. And then, yeah, I mean, it just underwent all these transformations. And each one of these transformations uh, represented a, a, you know, watering down of its power and a subversion of its authority to the traditional state powers. So what I was referring to here is just that that was basically the final blow. You know, that was that death knell, essentially, uh, of, of worker control control of the entire national region. So yeah, I do believe that's it. Yeah. Last one. <clears throat> So this one went pretty long. Like, as I told you, these Anarch, you know, respond videos, I'm really not going to cap the amount of time that I spend on them. But uh, these were all the comments that I thought were, were, you know, most interesting from this video. And I intend to keep doing this with more of my videos. Uh, I think I am going to do what I said in a previous video. I'm going to keep alternating. So next week, I'll probably do Anarch Abridged again. I'll choose a topic and then I'll do another Anarch Responds and I'll keep going back and forth on these. Um, but the next Anarch Responds, which will be week after next, I will be doing part three of the State is Counter Revolutionary. And then I'll continue just kind of proceeding through my catalog. Um, and eventually I'll get to the Anarch Abridged videos. So if you want me to respond to your comments on video, just understand that leaving comments under any of my videos uh, makes it likely that I'll read them and possibly respond to them in a video just like this in a future Anarch Responds. Also, I just want to emphasize once again that I just published part three of A Modern Anarchism. So um, I just want to say that, you know, these video essays take an enormous amount of effort. Uh, parts one, two, and three are all like two hours long. They take me months to finish. I think uh, the shortest one was like eight months, and then it was nine months and ten months. Okay, so these have taken me, I've been spending years on Modern Anarchism parts one, two, and three. So please go give those a watch. Um, those are where I put in a huge amount of my effort. And I just also want to say, those of you who become patrons, you're the reason why I can create all of this content. The big video essays, Anarch Responds, Anarch Abridged, and so on and so on, and maybe some live streams to come. Uh, these 
the patrons are the reason why I'm able to do this, why I'm able to put this much time into the channel. So if you like what I'm doing here, if you appreciate these videos, please go become a patron at patreon.com slash anarch, A-N-A-R-K. Also, if you like the video, go click like. Uh, you know, if this is your first time coming to the channel, or if you've been watching numerous videos and this is like your fifth or sixth one that you've clicked, go click subscribe. I mean, this is, you know, just the kind of content I create on this channel. And uh, once again, go comment below, you know, I mean, it helps with engagement, but also maybe one day I will come around to this video or any other video and I'll see your comment and respond to it. Also, I just want to say, insofar as that you're trying to help my metrics, because a few people have asked about it, the main metrics that matter on this website, even though everybody's telling you, like, click like and subscribe and so on, are watch time. So that's to say, you know, when you start a video, how long do you keep watching? The longer you watch, the better that is for metrics. And when you see my video and recommendations, how often do you click the thumbnail? So essentially the combination of seeing one of my thumbnails and then clicking it and then watching it for a long time, that's the best metric for improving my engagement on this and getting my videos pushed into the algorithm. So if you're trying to help the channel, that's a huge help to the channel. But I'm just going to cease my rambling. Uh, I think that we've reached the end of this here video. Uh, I can hear fireworks going on outside. I guess they're celebrating that my, my hour 10 minute video has completed, but that's it for this one, everybody. I'll see you next time.